Yes, and uh, not only a proud co-host of this meeting, but also the number two at our institution. And who better to interview on stage than the number two at NATO? Great to have my good friend, the Deputy Secretary General, with us uh, today. I've been given two pieces of instructions. A, use the whooping 20 minutes that we get to talk about everything that the Secretary General didn't talk about. Um, <laughs> And make sure that you understand one thing, and it seems to be very important. Please don't line up behind the microphone. Go to the microphone once I point at you directly. We'll practice this in a minute. Because we're such good friends... But it's good to be number two. It is brilliant to be number two. Yeah. The number one sits in there, NATO. so oh, yeah. I'm a happy number two. Um, and thank you for lending Boris Ruge to us. Uh, yeah, he will be our new assistant regional for public, uh, for policy and security, replacing Bettina. And also we have our new D uh, ASG for PDD. Uh, bonjour, madame. Yes, la bienvenue. So it's good to be number two, indeed. Excellent. Yeah, yeah and please give poor respect when you're done with yeah. it. <laughs> so, um, you know, some of the things that the Secretary General didn't talk about, China, climate change, cooperation between the European Union and NATO, but for some reason, he also missed talking about Greek and Roman goddesses. And I have a couple to go through. Amongst many other things, you're responsible for innovation at NATO. And uh, let's talk about Diana. Diana, the defense innovation accelerator for the North Atlantic, and the Roman goddess, not only of hunting, childbirth, but most importantly, of crossroads. Did you know that? So we at NATO, we in the Alliance, are certainly at crossroads when it comes to innovation. And, and I'm wondering, are we taking the right turn? Uh, are we going in the right direction? Are we learning the light, right lessons on innovation from the war in Ukraine? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I chair the innovation board in NATO. I'm very happy that uh, with the Munich uh, Sicherheit Conference, we have this partnership between our advisory groups. Um, there's nothing more fundamental uh, for our alliance and for the free world than to maintain our technological edge. It's the essence of who we are, the essence uh, of our economies, of our militaries, and in the end, uh, this is something that NATO uh, is doing. So, to be honest, I'm also pleasantly surprised how fast allies have moved and we moved on this one. So we discussed about Diana um, uh, just two years back, I think. Now it's up and running. The first challenge uh, is up for startups and innovators that uh, would like to work with us. More than 100 test centers and accelerators across our great alliance in Europe and North America, um, universities, uh, research centers, um, uh, the best and the finest. Because if you look to uh, what NATO countries uh, do possess, we are basically uh, uh, in an ecosystem of innovation that has absolutely no, no rival. And this is why we, we are working on Diana. And, uh, the, and it goes hand in hand with the other uh, total innovation. We have launched uh, the NATO Innovation Fund, which is the first ever multinational sovereign venture capital fund. Sounds like a contradiction in terms? Uh, no, because we also feel the need to put a little bit of seed money into the startups that are using Diana. Smart idea. We help the young innovators from all over the Alliance to cross the valley of death uh, until and unless, of course, they will go to the real markets and the real venture capital world. So yes, we are doing good. We are working with our partners. Um, uh, I remember inviting an Australian uh, cyber slash quantum company to brief us. We are, we are talking to, uh, to Korea, to, to South Korea, to Japan, to many of our partners. So yeah, uh, uh, technolog technological edge uh, is the underpinning of everything we do in defense, in economy, in society, in democracy. So I would like everyone to know that we are really doing our best to, to, to move forward on that one too. So Diana, as a goddess, uh, I think should be pleased with NATO today. Excellent. You mentioned money first. Um, let's turn to another god, Plutus, the god of wealth and abundance and defense investment, I have you know. Um, as we pointed out in our 
wonderful report that came out last week, sorry for the advertising here, defense sitters. We make the point that a lot of us in Europe are still sitting on defense when it comes to defense, um, particularly when it comes to investment. So, so how do we get more Plutos, particularly in, in Europe? How do we increase investment in innovation? You did mention that we put a little money into the innovation fund. Um, how do we get more money in there? Listen, we don't want NATO to be a substitute for what national governments and private sector are doing or academia are doing. We think and we are acting as a catalyst for harnessing the innovation ecosystem uh, across our great alliance. So in a way, we are uh, sending a demand signal. As we are sending a demand signal to our defense industrial uh, base, uh, through the NATO planning processes, through uh, the new regional plans that our leaders uh, will be adopting in, in, in a few hours from now. We're also sending a demand signal to the technological world when it comes to NATO. As you know, we have uh, 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 Allied Command operations in shape, led by uh, General Cavoli, and also have uh, Allied Command transformation in Ofol, led by General Lavigne, who is also working on DDA, defense planning, but also uh, the, the capstone concept, which is the technological uh, angle uh, from NATO. So what we are also doing uh, to, to governments, and this is also we are trying to, uh, to help allies avoid a false dilemma. Because until the war in Ukraine that Russia started so brutally and aggressively, there was lots of people thinking that the next uh, generation of warfare and technology should be only high-end high-end, high-end, and less, uh, let's say, more, more substantive forces. So now we have basically a situation you have back in Europe, uh, high-intensity warfare, so you need to invest more to have conventional and, and multi-domain forces, and also to invest in high-end technologies. So what NATO does is making sure that we avoid for allies the false dilemma of saying I should do either technology, high-end, or uh, conventional uh, deterrence and defense. No, it's one thing, it's multi multi-dimensional, it's multi-domain, as we call it. And again, NATO is an aggregator and uh, 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 an organization that sends a demand signal to, to, to our governments, to our private sector. So we don't see any fracture, uh, which would be, I think, artificial and counterproductive between having strong conventional deterrence and defense forces and high-end space, cyber, uh, sensors, uh, integrated, uh, issues. So that's the beauty of NATO, that we are the, the, the great aggregator. And I think also uh, uh, Greek mythology is helping us with, uh, uh, with, with uh, finding this role for NATO. We are doing this actively and uh, this summit in Vilnius will be nothing short of, uh, of exceptional. We expect our leaders to reconfirm the, uh, and to confirm the new defense investment pledge, the Vilnius uh, pledge had in Wales, 2% uh, minimum and 20% of the 2% uh, as a minimum also for higher end uh, new equipment, new technologies. So we hope that this will be very positive for all our allies and also for our citizens, because in fact the business of NATO is to keep 1 billion uh, citizens uh, uh, safe. Security is the foundation of prosperity. Security is the foundation of democracy. Uh, security is the foundation of, 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 of normal life for our citizens. And also with the, with the Swedish uh, new allies, we are looking forward to having them too. Perfect. Thank you so much. From uh, the god of wealth and defense investment to the goddess of victory, Nike. Um, when, when we had the, the previous panel, one of the prime ministers said, um, today we are training the Ukrainians, tomorrow they will be training us. Can you maybe shed some light on how we are already interacting with the Ukrainians on innovation and what innovation has proved helpful and how to you know, roll it out to the troops? I would say we are in a very interesting cycle of what I would call circular lessons learned. They learn a lot from us. We've been training Ukrainian uh, troops uh, after 2014, after the illegal occupation of Crimea by Russia, uh, in large numbers. Uh, I, I, I've seen Prime Minister Trudeau uh, here just before, uh, just before us, and Canada only has trained since 2014 tens of thousands of Ukrainian uh, troops. So Ukrainians are learning a lot from us, command and control, NATO doctrine, how to use smart equipments, and they're moving away from the Soviet era, not only equipments, but also doctrine, which is so obsolete and so uh, underperforming. But we're also learning from them. 
is not only us, our militaries, but also our private sector. Lots of things we do for Ukraine are coming from governments, but also from private sector, uh, for cyber, for space, uh, for smart apps. And I think also NGOs uh, working uh, embedded in the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine like we do not do in NATO. So I think it's a circular uh, lessons learned process. And uh, we are looking forward to, to making these things even more structured. Uh, so they learn from us, we learn from them, and together we are stronger. Perfect. Many thanks. Now that I have warmed you up, let's turn to you and let's begin to grill the DSG. Can I see... Uh -huh. this, is, this is for number twos? Two? That's for number okay. twos, yes. Okay. That's advertisement and for the uh, job. Can I warn you, my staff has printed out a five-page list of Greek and Roman goddesses, uh, major and minor. If you don't ask questions, I'll just continue with the god of war, um, the goddess of wilderness, and some others. So okay, you better grilling, raise your grilling. hands now. <laughs> Please, sir, come to the microphone. Hello, uh, Tomasz Smura, uh, Kasmi Płaski Foundation from Poland. I've got a question which was uh, uh, not asked in previous panel. I mean the question about, uh, of course, we are in the Vilnius, but we have still some homework uh, to do from, from Madrid. I mean the especially new NATO force structure. So we decided that we increase our, our num number of the troops in high readiness status to 300,000. And actually we also heard some rumors that there are still significant problems to deliver on, on this promise. So I, I'd like to ask where are in the, uh, we are in the process of, of implementing uh, you know, decision from the Madrid in this particular dimension. Thank you. No, thank you for the question. As I mentioned, our leaders will be approving uh, over the summit uh, the most transformative uh, change in defense planning and defense command and control and force structure in generations. Uh, because, as I mentioned before, high-intensity warfare is back in Europe and technology is also part of this, of this issue. And, of course, as we have seen uh, over the last 20, 25 years, many allies, especially European allies, have been collecting the peace dividend. And there was not so much need to invest in industrial base, in, uh, in, uh, in, in our militaries. Now we need to do that. So against the regional plans that will be approved by our leaders, and I don't want to prejudge what leaders will do, but we, we, we are we're expecting them to approve this. The consequences of this new generation of defense plans, northern region, central European region, and southern uh, European region, the southeast Black Sea and Mediterranean as a continuum, will be starting to implement the plans will be starting to appropriate uh, resources and troops and equipment uh, to a higher readiness, to higher numbers, with more training, with more preposition of equipment, according to the plans. It doesn't mean that we have everything today that the plans will be indicating to us. We had the first uh, fourth generation conference just a few weeks back, and we have done a lot. We have still things to do. So the implementation of the plans will take some time but once we decide politically in NATO, that standard will become reality. And I'm confident, and we are confident in NATO, that all allies uh, will, be, will be investing in the plans that our leaders will, will, uh, will approve, uh, that our military leaders have been working. I have to thank uh, uh, General Cavoli and his team, because they've been delivering the plans for us. I think it's, uh, Carmen help me, I think 20 months ahead of schedule, Carlo? 20 months ahead of schedule. So that's a formidable piece of military work, and our leaders will be approving this. So I can give you with full confidence that the targets, force structure, command and control, will be, will be, will be met in time, in iterations, uh, by all allies. Perfect. Thank you so much over there, please. And thank you for not lining up behind the microphone. Full points on that. Cécile Maisonneuve from Montaigne Institute and French Institute for International Relations. Uh, I'm going to bring another god, Hermès, god of traders and merchants. Uh, innovation is also related with free trade, and we see more and more the return of industrial policy, subsidies. So how can NATO ensure that this new, uh, this new return of sovereignty of industrial policy doesn't challenge uh, innovation and free trade, which is also a basic of our multilater multilateral order? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, 
there is a new geopolitical and geoeconomic reality around the world, not only in Europe, around the world. And we've seen this with the pandemic, we've seen this with the financial crisis, we are seeing now with war in Europe, we are seeing a different landscape in geopolitics and geoeconomics. So what we can say, and what I can say, and I think uh, uh, everyone would agree, that will all of us will have to pay a premium for economic security. Economic security doesn't mean not to do business and not to do trade and not to, 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 to basically hamper international commerce. That needs to continue. But we have to make sure that we are not uh, basically just by uh, negligence or just by, uh, by not, real, not, not recognizing the new reality in the world that we are now being, becoming vulnerable economically. In supply chain, we do not want to replace the hyper-dependency on Russian gas with hyper-dependency on rare earth and materials from other players. So how to find the balance between continuing to do business, we need to do business, business is good, is growing the economies, is creating jobs, but in a way that will be making sure that we are not uh, uh, importing risks because uh, the geopolitics and geoeconomics of the world are intertwined like never before. And this is why that's what we do in NATO, that's what European Union is doing, and I see Charles Fries, uh, my good friend here in the audience, that's what we do, the G7 is doing, uh, just to find the right balance between uh, 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 doing trade, uh, legitimate trade, good trade, and also making sure that we put uh, ourselves uh, at bay from becoming over-dependent. Uh, and God forbid, in, case, in time of crisis, you could have bad surprises, and this is something that NATO is also uh, making all allies and partners aware of. Perfect. Thank you so much. Depending on the length of the next question, uh, we have time for one or two questions and goddesses. Okay, oh. thank you. So, uh, I'm Eugenia from the Atlantic Council of Albania. Um, I guess that this is the panel of goddess, so I've got the war of goddess here tattooed. But my question is, will it be the Vilnius summit a missed opportunity for Ukraine as the Bucharest summit was years ago? And the main question that we all think about, are we ready to trigger Article 5? Thank you. An easy one. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that tattoo I think is dangerous. Um, listen, I cannot prejudge what our leaders will decide in a few hours and in the next, uh, in the next two days here in Vilnius. I can say something that I know and I also feel it. Uh, this will be a landmark successful summit for this alliance. This will be building upon what we have decided in Madrid, which was also historical and transformative, and also will be also a bridge towards the Washington summit of July 2024, when our great alliance will be celebrating our 75th anniversary. Uh, I don't want to prejudge what allies will decide on, on Ukraine. I think Ukraine is moving closer to us. Secretary General has said it in the morning in his very forum. I'm confident that on all the big pieces that we have been preparing for, for one year in NATO, and our leaders will decide, good news for Ukraine, good news for Sweden, good news for invest defense, uh, defense investment, good news for technology, good news for our partnerships. We've been meeting, uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand will be meeting all our Indo-Pacific partners in a minute with the Secretary General. So I would say, without uh, declaring victory before uh, the curtain falls, on this beautiful summit, that the Vilnius summit will be remembered as one of the most successful summits we had in some time, and this is why we're here. And I want to thank also our Lithuanian hosts for the impeccable organization of this, of this summit. Speaking of the curtain falling, we have one minute and one second for a very brief question and an even briefer answer. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie Sloan is Pasternak, Finnish Institute of International Affairs. We heard earlier that the plans are based on two threats, Russia and terrorist organizations. Um, culture language plays a lot in how deterrence is perceived. How is NATO now going to change or changing the way it communicates deterrence and STRATCOM more broadly to these adversaries? Let me say just very briefly that the is not only the geopolitics and geoeconomics uh, are changing dramatically, but also the very definition of security is changing dramatically. We have cyber, we have space, we have climate change and security. Uh, we have so many resilience that we, have, we are doing a lot in NATO about. 
and we're doing a lot with the Munich Security Conference and also with the GMF and Atlantic Council on many, many fronts together. So what I'm just saying that is not only Stratcom, which is important, but is also substance. So nothing that relates to security in the broadest definition of terms is stranger to NATO. We have the obligation to do the bread and butter, deterrence and defense, making sure that we, we, we resist these aggressions from all over directions. But also the business of NATO is to make sure that we are always adapting to a changing uh, definition of security and a changing world. And that's why uh, NATO has been labeled until now. And that's not, not STRATCOM or marketing, uh, not even for number twos, the most successful alliance in history. Why? Because we showed unity in times of difficulty and we have a gene of adaptation inside uh, NATO. And before closing, because uh, it's last second, I would like to thank also uh, the audience, not in this room. I'm very happy to see my friends from Aspen, Romania and others. Um, uh, I know that this, this uh, public forum uh, is a great success. And I want to thank my colleagues, uh, the organizers. Carmen, you're, you're coming here. I think we should give you a round of applause too. Let's give a round of applause to Carmen. And like, like in every good action movie, our timer stopped with one second to go. Thank you for joining us, uh, a great uh, number TUR. Good luck for the summit and thanks for being such a loyal guest and friend.